Good morning. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. Why don't you sing with us? Church. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that is open for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We know that we will enter God's presence because our hearts have been made clean by the perfect life and the sacrificial death and the powerful resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the promises of God will be fulfilled because the promiser has proven his faithfulness. And if we know how it's all going to turn out, then how should we live right now while we're waiting? Well, the scripture tells us to love one another, to live lives of service and to inspire others to do the same, to meet together, to encourage each other. We live like this because we know the promised day will come and all things will be made right. 
love, serve, encourage, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's continue worshiping together. In the darkness we were waiting With our hope and with our light To from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt morning. I would like you to pick up a Bible and turn 
in the Bible to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. It'd be important for you to get a Bible this morning, and while you're doing that, let me just explain a little bit about the context of this passage. The book of Revelation is the most mysterious part of the Bible for most people, and it has spawned many bizarre ideas about the Christian faith through the centuries. Many people view it as kind of a puzzle that is meant to be uh, put together in some way, and they puzzle over it all of their lives. And while there are different ways of understanding the book, the purpose for which the book was written is crystal clear. And once you discern that purpose, it becomes easier to see how the parts somehow fit into that purpose. The purpose of the book of Revelation is to encourage believers of every generation to remain steadfast in their faith and their testimony to Jesus Christ, despite whatever obstacles that we face. And with that purpose in mind, you can see that the book unfolds a series of images or pictures of the wrapping up of world history and what will follow that. And, and the whole book is meant to assure us that in the end, we can be faithful because God wins. God wins. And those who are his faithful people win with him as well. Now, before I read a few verses from the last chapter of the Bible, I want to note the context at this point in the book. The, the last three chapters unfold like this. Chapter 20 presents what we think of as the return of Christ. It, it ends with a great tribulation, and then God intervenes in world history, sending Christ from heaven to return to this earth. And that is followed by the defeat of Satan and uh, by a judgment at the great white throne of God in which not only Satan and his hosts, but all human beings of all world history are presented there before God. And it involves the final revealing of who is lost and who is saved, with the lost cast into the lake of fire and the saved brought into the new heavens and the new earth, which is this universe in which we live now only transformed refashioned to be a fitting home for the people of God. Then when you open chapter 21, you enter into a new era of history. That is what is called the eternal state. It uh, gives us three different glimpses of what the eternal state is like. Now, I want you to understand it mirrors the first two chapters of the Bible in one grand way. The first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, present to us what this world was like before sin entered into the world. And the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, present to us what this world will be like when sin has been defeated and removed. So that, that's important to understand. And when you come to chapter 21, it begins to take three steps. It's like three images of what the eternal state is like. First, in chapter 21 and verse 1, the Apostle John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. But when he goes on, he doesn't describe the new heaven and new earth. He never does. He simply says it's like a bride adorned for her husband on their wedding day. And he goes on to describe that what, what this involves, this new heavens and new earth, is a intimacy restored in the relationship between God and human beings. And he ends that little section, just a few verses, with a, a, an invitation and a warning. Two sentences. Take the water of life. That's the invitation. And remember, in the lake of fire, in the previous chapter, all those who have rejected God and proved it by their lifestyle are there. It's as though he's saying to the reader, ponder this, which one are you? Where are you on that day? Then he goes on and he starts into a second image. In verse 9 of chapter 20, an angel says to John, let me show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And then what he shows him is not a bride. What he shows him is a city. And when he describes the city in the rest of the chapter, he's describing a temple with the walls around the temple. 
And uh, he again ends this image, if the first one is a bride and the second is a temple, he ends it with an invitation and a warning. He says, nothing unclean will ever enter this city, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And it is as though he's saying to the reader, which one are you? And then the angel shows him one more thing, and that's what we want to look at this morning, just five verses. The first five verses of chapter 22 of the Revelation. And I want you to note that when he goes on to describe even further what the temple is like, he doesn't describe a temple. He really describes a garden. So read with me Genesis, or Revelation chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Before we look into this, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our gracious God, we acknowledge before you even now that you alone reign from the realm of heaven over all the things that you have made. And how we long for that day when your rule of this universe is made real and manifested in the sight of all living people and when you establish your rule. We long for that. We long to be a part of it. And so we invite you to open our minds to understand a little bit about this passage and move our hearts to obey what we find there. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's no question that the Bible does not have the standing that it once did in American life. Even when I was a child, though I realize that's um, 66 years ago, of course, not everyone believed in the Bible, but it was not common for people to speak against the Bible. It was sort of like speaking against mom and the American flag and apple pie. But in all the changes of the last 66 years, I suppose apple pie is the only one left with its reputation intact. You should know, and if you don't, you really need to think about it. There's quite a strong movement in the Western world to view the Bible as hate literature, um, particularly because of its moral teachings. It's not uncommon today for politicians to be called out for believing that the Bible has any kind of authority to guide human life. In fact, some very prominent politicians in the United States have suggested that such people have no place being in a leadership position in our country. When I came to Christ in college, um, I and many other people like me regularly carried our Bibles with us when we went to class and when we went to a restaurant so that we could read it in our spare time. You hardly ever see that anymore. I mean, today in general, the Bible is viewed at its best. If it's viewed as having any value, it's thought of as being a, an historic literary text. It's placed on the level of Homer's Iliad or Odyssey or Tacitus's lives of noble Romans. It should be studied so it's thought by those who find that sort of thing interesting, which of course represents a very tiny segment of humanity, but it's really not important for anyone else to read it or think about it. 
On the other hand, at its worst, it is often viewed as being part of that tradition, particularly in the Western world, which exemplifies everything that is wrong with our culture today. Misogyny and discarded moral values and racial superiority and religious intolerance and all of those things. But in either case, whether it's valued for an historical reason or it's maligned and discarded, it's not taken seriously. Now, the Bible itself, when it's read carefully, purports to be a unique historical text. It claims that though different people wrote it, the true author is God himself. Uh, in it, he speaks to human beings from a different realm, the spiritual realm, heaven itself. And, and the Bible represents or presents, I'm sorry, uh, moral teachings that purport to come from God himself, not just to be something that people thought up. And it presents those moral teachings, not simply as bare requests that God makes to us. If you want to do this, that would be a good thing. It doesn't present it even as an invitation, like here's something that you ought to consider. The, the moral teachings of the Bible are presented as the mandate of the living God that human beings are, are commanded to live by and that we fail to do that to our own peril. The Bible contains warnings and promises and threats that it presents with divine authority. They're meant to bring us into conformity to God's eternal values, and it, it even tells us that there are penalties and there are rewards that flow out of that that have eternal significance. This morning, what I'd like to do is use these few verses in the book of Revelation to seek to convince you that you ought to pay attention to the Bible. If you already respect it, I'd like to convince you you should read it regularly. You should seek to embrace its teachings, to build them into your life so that it alters the way you think and feel and the way you act in relationship with other people. I, I, if, um, on the other hand, you're a person who, who doesn't respect the Bible, questions its authority, I'd like you to listen this morning to the Bible's call to urge you to listen to its message, to consider the fact of what it actually says that it is, God's Word written, which commands your attention and demands your obedience. Now, this passage that I read, these five verses, when it's considered in light of its place in the Bible, which it's at the very end of the Bible, and in light of the fact that it draws upon so many themes that are built throughout the Bible, it functions like a wake-up call to um, call us to realize we're dealing with no mere human document. We're dealing with something that has divine authority. It's meant to produce in us um, both an understanding, but also a sense of awe, a, a feeling of quiet self-examination, even a feeling of fear. You know, I, I don't like it when preachers try to reduce or try to produce fear, and I'm sure you don't either, but I don't mind it when the Bible itself seeks to produce in us a sense of fear. This passage is meant to do that. Now, what I'd like to do simply is to, from this passage and others that we'll draw together, I want to seek to give you two reasons why you should pay attention to the Bible. The first one is intellectual, and the second one is emotional. Um, the first is just based on what this passage says, and the second is based on the feelings that this passage evokes. First the intellectual, then the emotional. I'd like to look at these two together. The first reason that you should pay attention to the Bible and its message is because the Bible lands where it takes off. The Bible lands where it takes off. I, I, I want to explain what I mean by that. I first heard that, I can't remember, it was either from Charles Swindoll, who's a famous pastor, or Haddon Robinson, who was a professor of mine, uh, of preaching, and it, it, wherever I heard it from, the person wasn't describing the Bible. 
they were talking about what it means to speak from the Bible, what, what preaching is all about. And what he said was that the most effective kind of message that a preacher can give um, ends where it begins. It lands where it takes off. The most effective sermon is going to start with some kind of illustration or story or theme. And then it's going to circle back throughout the sermon and it's going to land on the same illustration or theme or story. And of course, I have to tell you, just doing that, landing where you take off, doesn't make a sermon good. However, if the content in between those two points is interesting and informative and, and motivating, then if you land where you take off, it really does uh, have power. It's true because you, you start from a place and you circle back and you end there and the, the, the hearer feels a sense of unity and understanding of a single point. And I've been doing this long enough to know that that is incredibly hard to do and I have not always done that. But, but that's not the point. What I want to do is take that same idea of landing where you take off and I want to apply it to the Bible. The Bible, in a superlative way, lands where it takes off. The last three chapters of the Bible mirror the first three chapters of the Bible. Actually, we would say the beginning of the Bible is mirrored by the end of the Bible. The whole first book, Genesis, in a sense, is completed by Revelation. But in a, in a remarkable way, the first three chapters are mirrored in the last three chapters. Even though those parts of the Bible were written 1,600 years apart from each other, written in two different languages, ancient Hebrew, not even the Hebrew that the Bible we have today is written in, in the form, ancient Hebrew and what is called Koine Greek, common Greek, which was the descendant of classical Greek, like uh, Homer wrote in, uh, is written in these two completely different languages. Uh, one of those, Eastern and Semitic, and the other one, Indo-European, Greek, they're completely different languages establishing completely different worldviews. They were written to two completely different audiences. The first book of the Bible was written to Israel, the people of God who were the physical descendants of Abraham. The second, the end of the Bible, was written to the church, that is, people drawn from all the nations to be a part of the people of God. And there are more differences. In fact, last year I, I read a book that was entitled The End of the Beginning. It's by an Australian Anglican author. Um, he takes just five themes, and I had read about this book before and wanted to read it. He takes five themes that unfold in the Bible. They're found in seed form in the first three chapters of the Bible. They're then developed in great ways as you move through the Bible. And in a remarkable way, they, they end up being resolved, completed in the end. And the book was incredibly hard to read. I mean, it was very scholarly work. It was quite complex. In fact, it was one of those books, you know, where, where I felt like it, there were paragraphs that I didn't understand because it was requiring a level of understanding of some topic or theme in the Bible that I'd never thought about before. And I would have to look it up and, and read about it in order to get through the page. It was really complex. And one of the things I began to see is if the Bible is a book that purports to come from God, you would expect that it would take the greatest possible literary devices that are imaginable, things that we, we discern in great novels, and it would present them in a very complex, huge form. And that is what the Bible does. And here we have in the last... Uh, in, in these five verses, um, we have something we want to camp on because it's the point where all kinds of things come together in a few simple words. The resolve the story that begins at the beginning of the Bible. And I'd like you to see that it's almost beyond human capacity to consider that someone or ones could have put this together in this way. Look at the passage, Revelation 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Now here's what you need to understand to grasp what that is signifying. 
In the very beginning of the Bible, it describes the original creation. In Genesis chapter 2, we are told about the setting in which the first two humans were placed. And we read this in Genesis 2 verse 10. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. They are named the Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates, only two of which we can identify today. Now, now let me describe the setting of that simple verse. The setting is that the man is placed in a cultivated garden, a beautiful garden like the garden of a king. And there he walks in fellowship with the Creator. In a, a larger territory called Eden that surrounds the garden, that is, is um, a place that God rules, he, he is told that Eden is a place that he is to tend and keep. More about that in a moment. But Eden means something like pleasure. And then what we read is that outside of Eden, there's the rest of the wild, uncultivated earth. The earth that we know now. The first humans were placed on the uh, earth in Eden to subdue the earth by turning it into an Eden. That was the task given to them. And we're told in this simple verse that water flowed out of Eden to water the garden and it moved from there into the rest of the earth in these four rivers. And here's what's important to understand. As the Bible unfolds, that scene that took place in Eden with the garden inside of it and the uncultivated earth outside of it is recreated in first the tabernacle, this massive tent-like structure with a courtyard that Israel built in the wilderness, and later in the temple that was simply a permanent structure of the same thing. They are recreations of the Garden of Eden. The uh, courtyard, this large area, which has uh, in it some implements of worship, it represents Eden, and then the temple proper or tabernacle, which had a holy place and a most holy place where only the priests could go, that represents the garden, the place of fellowship with God. And outside of it, outside of the courtyard, is the wild nation on the earth living not in obedience to God. That's what the temple represented. And interestingly, when the temple or the tabernacle were built, right outside the holy place was this huge, it's called the bronze laver, that is like a huge bathtub holding hundreds of gallons of water. And it was where the priests bathed, but it represented the water that flowed from Eden, it's in the courtyard, into, so to speak, the holy place, the sanctuary, the place of fellowship with God. The priests had to bathe in that before entering the holy place. Now, later what you find as this develops in the Bible is that Ezekiel, a great prophet, has a vision of the final temple, the heavenly temple in the end. And he sees in his vision water flowing from underneath the temple, under the altar, flowing out into the garden or into the temple. And, and the same image is used in Zechariah chapter 14, another one of the prophets, and Joel chapter 3. And, and what you have, and we just we can't really develop these things, what you have in the end is you have that recreated. Water flows, but now the water of life flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Water is the source of life. It's a source of cleansing and empowerment. It, it, it is flowing in this final image, not from the place of fellowship with God, but from God himself. This is the completion of the image. The whole idea of water flowing from God to cleanse and empower and strengthen his people. This water flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flows down through the streets of the city in a rather complicated uh, image that's used. But the, the, the fact is this, every single word in this passage it is drawn from multiple Old Testament passages, so much that scholars debate in different things, like the use of the phrase water of life. They debate which place in the Old Testament has primary significance here and which has secondary. That's the first thing, the water of life. 
read on the middle of verse two. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The tree of life was in the garden, remember, in the very beginning. Most people miss that because it's only mentioned twice. But the tree of life was there and they were not forbidden to eat from it. They were forbidden to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the tree of life represents eternal life, living forever, God's quality of life. But here it's presented in this passage, though it uses the word singular, the singular word tree, it apparently is referring to multiple trees. On either side of the river, each one produces 12 different kinds of fruit and its leaves are for healing. I want you to remember that not only was there a tree of life in the garden, but when the garden was recreated in the temple, there was also a tree of life. It was called the lampstand. The lampstand was a huge, it's called a menorah today, seven-limbed tree, an image of that, an olive tree, in which the end of each held oil and burned as a lamp so that the seven lamps brilliantly lit would light the holy place when the priests went in there. It represented the tree of life. And this again is developed uh, throughout the Old Testament as well. When you walked into the tabernacle or the temple in the first room, there were inscribed on the walls all the way around images of palm trees and certain kinds of fruits. It was meant to recreate the setting of a garden, just like the first humans found themselves in. It was the place of fellowship with God. Now here you come to Revelation 22 and you come to the final garden. It represents um, the tree of life. It represents life free from wounds, free from sorrow and pain and hardship, life in abundance where every tear is wiped away, where rejoicing is eternal, and it fulfills this whole image of the garden, but it fulfills so much of the Old Testament, it fulfills even the wisdom literature, like the books of Proverbs and, and Ecclesiastes, where it describes wisdom like partaking of the tree of life. And it brings it to a conclusion. What was available in the beginning to the first two humans, what they lost in the fall since entrance was barred, to the garden where the tree of life stood in Genesis chapter 3, it is now restored, transformed, multiplied in its significance in the end. Do you see how the, the Bible lands where it takes off? Here's another thing, verse 3, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. Now, the only being in Genesis chapter 3 who is directly cursed is the serpent, uh, representing Satan. And of course, when you come to Revelation 22, he's no longer there. Nothing accursed is present because he is in the lake of fire. Um, but the earth was cursed in Genesis 3, and, and that meant that everything about human life and animal life became more difficult than it was originally intended to be. It alters this curse on the earth, the sphere of responsibility of the man and the woman and their uniqueness. It infects and affects all of society, uh, the responsibilities of men and women. It unfolds in the Bible then and how the curse works its way out in the wars of men and nation. Its consequence is not only death, though that's the basic description of the consequence of sin, but it's death in all of its forms, all of the problems in human relationships, all of the dangers of money, sex, and power, all of the mistreatment of the poor, all of the lies that fuel people and nations to war. And now in the end, no more curse. That which entered the garden through the serpent has now been removed. What was imposed in Genesis 3 is removed in Revelation 22. And then again, the, the middle of verse three, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Now this one we could camp out on for hours, but I can only give you a brief description, not much of an explanation. 
It's important to understand that in Genesis 2, Adam was placed in the garden as though it were a temple, place of fellowship with God. And he's placed in the garden in order to fulfill a priestly function. And we know that because of two words that are used in Genesis chapter 2. It, it says that he was put in the garden to work it and to keep it. And those two Hebrew words are only put together in one other context in the Old Testament. They're put together in that form to work and to keep um, when it describes the functions of the priest in the temple later. When Israel built the tabernacle and later the temple and the priest ministered by going into the holy priest and, or holy place and the high priest once a year into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, it says that they were placed there in order to serve that's the word translated work, but it's the same word in Genesis 2. And, and to guard, it says, which in Genesis 2 is the word keep, to serve and to guard. They were to serve God in the temple, and they were to guard the temple by removing anything that was common, unclean, cursed. And that's what Adam was placed in the garden to do. The thing that priests were designed to do later, he was to serve God by tending and keeping the garden and expanding Eden throughout the earth. That's the image of Genesis 1 and 2, and that's a task at which he failed. He failed because he allowed the accursed thing into the garden, the serpent, to deceive his wife Eve while he stood passively by. Uh, one other note, what does it mean This his name will be on their foreheads? Well. In the Old Testament, only one person had the name of God on his forehead, literally, and that was the high priest. Part of the unique clothing that's described in Exodus and Leviticus of the high priest, in which every part of his clothing, every piece that is put together, has some kind of significance in, in showing the power and glory of God and the nature of sin and the necessary of a, a mediator. Part of the unique clothing was a golden plate that was placed on the turban and tied with a sash around the turban on top of his head. That golden plate read this, holy to the Lord. Literally, using the name of God, holy to Yahweh. It used the very name of God that was placed on his forehead representing the people as he went into the most holy place to sprinkle the blood to pay for sin. The name of God was literally on his forehead. In the end, the human race is restored to its original design as priests serving God again in his sanctuary. No longer to guard evil, that's not stated, because there is no evil to guard against at this point has been removed. But his name is on the foreheads of those who enter there. And then lastly, the last verse, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. I don't have time to look at light right here. Let's just take the last phrase, they will reign forever and ever. In the beginning of the Bible, the, the mandate given to the human race was to rule over God's creation as his representative. Have dominion over creation. That's the command given to the first two humans and to us as well. I mean, it carries out throughout the human race, have dominion, which meant that under the leadership of God, they were to rule as God's vice regents over his creation, building the creation to be that which would bring glory to him, turning the earth into an Eden. That was their function. But after the fall, though we still do that work, that work is now filled with pain. It's still given to humanity, but it's fulfilled with pain. It's fulfilled with the misuse of the earth, the raping of its resources. In the end, it will be fulfilled, finally. When uh, the effects of sin are removed and the redeemed are found there with God and they, they finally fulfill what he intended, they reign forever and ever. Now, let me note that that's an image that comes at the end. When he's describing the eternal state, he sees first a bride, then he sees a city, which is really a temple, and then when he's describing the city, what he really describes is a garden. And if the first two images end with an invitation and a warning, uh, this final image of the restored 
garden ends with the conclusion of the whole book. It's a series of verses, but they're the same thing. They're kind of expanded invitation and warning. That's how the book closes. So all I've said so far is that the first reason you ought to pay attention to the Bible is that it unfolds a story of God's intention to bring salvation through judgment and in the end to glorify himself by salvation through judgment. It opens in a garden representing the place of fellowship with God, intimate communion, and it closes finally in a garden, restored, transformed, expanded, and complete. And those whom he has redeemed in between those two points serve him eternally and rule with him over all of creation. You see, the Bible opens by introducing certain themes, certain images, things like garden, temple, covenant, city, rule, people, and it closes by developing and finalizing those themes in grand ways. It draws together all of those themes into a final crescendo of completion. And when you think about it, it's not one author who wrote that, at least one human author. It's a number of different people, at least 40. Over 1,600 years, vastly different languages and cultures and experiences of life, but all of them under the inspiration of God, writing down the things that God intended so that at the end there is one author. The Bible is God's word written. I really can't explain that I've just given you a taste in this passage of what the Bible is all about. I mean, I've only begun to explain the, the ways in which these themes are developed and grow to magnificent size through the Old and New Testament, but they, they are wrapped up in the end. The Bible lands where it takes off. I want to show you a second reason more briefly. The second reason why you should pay attention to the Bible. It's because in the end, the Bible invites us to experience the satisfaction of the deepest longings of the human heart. This is really an emotional or a psychological reason, but it's one that comes through very powerfully in these verses. There was a man about 1600 years ago named St. Augustine, you may have heard his name. He was actually a North African. Um, he was from a place in North Africa that is now called Algeria. And he was converted to Christ as an adult after living a very immoral life for a number of years. And his writings after that point became um, the basis of all Western theology since then. He wrote a book, one of the many books he wrote, called Confessions, that is really the most fascinating book. It's um, a play on words. The word confessions, in many languages, including our own, confess has two different meanings. A person can confess something if they admit, admit their guilt, their sin. That's to confess. If a criminal goes before a judge and says, yes, I did it, he or she is confessing, acknowledging their sin or their crime. The word confess means something else, though. It also means to openly declare one's faith to confess faith in God. And, and Augustine's confessions do both throughout the whole. It's the first time in which a person wrote down his feelings deeply about his whole life, and he explores throughout of it the waywardness of his heart as he moved through life. And, and the sins that he committed, he confesses those openly, and as he does that, he confesses his faith in God, the living God who tamed his waywardness made him teachable. It's really an interesting book. And here's one of the things he said in that book. It's a very famous quote. He said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person that cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by the creator made known through Jesus Christ. He's reflecting in that sentence a biblical truth that's stated throughout the Bible in many different ways this God-shaped vacuum that we try to fill with things. But I'd have to say, in a very telling way, it's evoked when you come to a passage like this. 
Genesis chapter 2 at the beginning of the Bible, after describing the original creation, the setting of the first two humans, that everything was exactly as God intended it, it ends with these kind of mysterious words, Genesis 2, verse 25, and the man and his wife were naked and they were not ashamed. I remember reading that in my youth and wondering, what, what, is the, what in the world is that about? Why would they, what would even tell us that they were naked and they were not ashamed? Um, well, it's really a fitting end to the first two chapters. It, it, it's a sign that, not just physically naked, uh, it, it's a sign of their complete vulnerability they experienced no walls. There, there was nothing between people, between husband and wife, between God and people, between parents and children and brothers and sisters. There was no fear. There was no uh, fear that one would be subverted, that you, one's body or mind or emotions or stability or relationships would be undermined and misused by another person in any way. And the reader, as he's reading, or she, it comes to the end of chapter 2 and reads this sentence, and it's meant to evoke within us like a, a question. The reader's invited to stop and ponder at that point and ask, why does this not describe my life now? Why was there no fear? Why were there no walls? Why is nakedness in my world, not just physically, but psychologically, emotionally, relationally, why is nakedness so dangerous, so unhealthy? It was not like that in the beginning. Genesis 3 opens with these fateful words. Now, the serpent was more crafty. You'll have to take my word on this, but it uses a Hebrew word, the word crafty, that sounds exactly the same as a different Hebrew word, and that is the word naked. It's meant to be a play on words. You end with this, the man and his wife were naked, but the serpent was more crafty. And the serpent is the explanation for why our world is not the way it's described at the end of chapter 2 in Genesis. Chapter 3 describes the first sin and its consequences that flow out in the rest of the Bible until you come to Revelation chapter 21. In the human heart, there is, it seems, a residual memory of that event in the garden. I don't mean we remember it. None of us were there. We were there, you might say, only in seminal form and that we are a race. And we descended from that first, two, that first pair of humans. In that sense, we were there, but we were not there ourselves. And I don't mean we remember what happened there. A residual memory is a memory like one's birth. No one remembers their birth. But what happens as we go through life is we experience birth. And, and we experience our parents. And then we may experience having children ourselves. And all of those things somehow puts form that's what I'm calling a residual memory. It puts form to something that we don't remember, but we know we were born. In the same way, our memory of Eden is more a feeling that is evoked by experiencing life in a fallen world. Every time we experience life in a fallen world, we have this feeling, I wasn't built for this. I wasn't built for this. I wasn't built for a world of death, sorrow, broken relationships, things that uh, break down, uh, children who rebel, things, uh, nations at war, pestilence, disease. I wasn't built for that. We, we have this feeling, but we shove it down because we don't know anything different than this. But there's something inside of us that says, I was built for something different than this. Well, the Bible is written, once read carefully, it was written to evoke within us an awakening of our deepest longings. This passage does it in, in a very real way. It, it, it describes life unhindered by pain and brokenness and sin. It, it describes life without constraint, life with God present in all of his fullness, all brokenness and sin and wounds gone where there's light and water and trees and healing, 
This passage is meant to be the mirror of Genesis chapter 2. If Genesis chapter 2 ends with this mysterious statement, the man and his wife are naked, that is meant to evoke in us a sense of, why? Why is my world like that, that, not like that? I was not built for a world like that, a broken world. This passage is meant to be the mirror of that, in which we say, that is what I was built for. I wasn't built for this broken world. I was built for a world in which it works. God is present. Life is full and whole. You know, few people take the Bible seriously enough to even read it today. Those who read it are too often simply trying to understand what it says. And we don't stop and ask, how does this make me feel? But I'm telling you, this passage is meant to evoke inside of you a, a stop and ask yourself a question, a self-reflection. How do I feel? When you feel as you read this passage and you realize that this ties together the whole Bible from beginning to end, it's the counterpart of the feeling I wasn't built for this broken world. This is the world I was built for. The God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person cannot be filled by created things. We try to do it with relationships, family, work, marriage, property, cars, whatever it is, we try to fill it. And you know what? It does work for a moment. It does work for a moment. It assuages the feeling of emptiness for a moment, but it leaves the vacuum empty because only God can fill it. He tells us that he can because he tells us that in the end, he wins, and those who love him know that they will win with him in the end. Let me close by noting one more thing. The writer, John the Apostle, under the inspiration of God, ends with an invitation and a warning. It's more expanded. I just want to note to you part of it. Here's what he says in verse 14, following the passage I read. He said, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have a right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I want you to note the contrast there that the, right, the reader, even you and I, we are meant to reflect on. You wash your robes. You find the cleansing of God through the blood of Christ. And it gives you the right to enter into the city. And it gives you the power to live in a different way. Or you acknowledge that outside... There are all those who have wandered far from God and have lived their lives without concern for him. That's the contrast. And then he closes with an invitation, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. It's a word of invitation to the reader, to the hearer, to you and me. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely, without price. That's the invitation that God makes. Can I just note for you, remember the contrast you just said, you know, uh, blessed are those who wash their robes. Outside are all these sinful people who loved and practiced falsehood. Now, when you think about who's outside, it's based on what they did in life. And you would think that the contrast should be, blessed are those who did what God said, because cursed are those who didn't. But that's not what it says. Blessed are those who have washed their robes, that they might have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter by the gates of the city. You see, it's only by coming to God without reliance on ourselves and our goodness and, and, 
and our power, it's by coming to God and recognizing that he alone is the source of life, that through his son, Jesus Christ, he paid for all of our sins. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they might have a right to the tree of life and the power of God to live for him. My friends, this is the invitation of God. It comes to you today. Come to God through Jesus Christ. Turn from sin. Rely on Christ's death for your sins and find life eternal. Let's pray. Our gracious God, as we bow before you again, we praise and thank you that you have given to us such a revelation of yourself. Difficult as it is to read and, and, and hard at points to understand, and much as it is maligned today, it is your word to us. I pray that as, as we consider how you have revealed to us your purposes for human life, that it may in very real ways capture our hearts that we might follow you willingly and embrace your word as the source of life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me Lifted me up, how great is your love. You bore my weakness, you took my shame, buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out, lifted me up, how great is your love. Step down to earth in this imperfection. Give your life for us. We are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe. For we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great. How great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. In your kindness, you lead me home. In your presence, where I belong.
so true there has never been and there will never be a God like you a love so true there has never been there will never be a God like you a love so favorite missionary stories is that of a man named Jim Elliot, and he said this, A man is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep in order to save that which he cannot lose. I love that quote so much because Jim Elliot gave up his life in order to save people to the gospel. Now, this is the kind of heart attitude that we as believers should always have when we think about giving. Because when we think about the things that we have to give, the things that we are losing are so much more insignificant when we think about the things that we are seeking to gain. This is the hard attitude we want as a church. We as Grace Church are going to move into a time of giving. This is something we do as a regular part of our worship and we invite you to do that with us. You can give several ways here at Grace Church. You can give by texting. You can give on our website, and you can give by mailing in a check to our address. Our hope as a church is not only that we would have this kind of humble heart when we think about giving up the things that we have, but our prayer is that God would use our gifts in order to gain the things that we cannot lose, and that is people to the gospel. Would you pray that with me now? Father God, we thank you so much for the gospel. We thank you that Jesus Christ gave up his life in order that we could have life with you, God. And I pray that you would use these gifts, that you would cause us to give as a church, and that our hearts would be softened to this because of the great grace in which we've been given, and that people would come to know you because of the gifts that we give today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Well, I just want to remind you that next Sunday, June 7th, we will have our very first outdoor summer service at 11 o'clock a.m. on the church property. Hopefully, you received uh, an email and also a letter through the mail from the elders that explains all of the details regarding that service. Uh, if you haven't received that letter, you can find that information on our website, but there's a number of details for you to be aware of about that service, so we encourage you to read through that and contact us if you have any questions at all. There are three options to participate in that service. The first is to sit, uh, bring your own chair and uh, some sunglasses and a cool drink and, and join us uh, outdoors. You can also uh, participate in the service from your uh, vehicle. We'll have a special place for people to park where you'll be able to see the platform. And then finally, uh, you can participate in that service by watching later on in the evening at seven o'clock p.m. We're gonna record the service in the morning, do a little bit of light editing, and we'll have that up online at seven o'clock uh, p.m. The one important piece to keep in mind about that service is that we will not be able to host everyone together at the same time. We, we just don't have the space. So we are requesting that anyone who would like to uh, come and attend that service pre-register online. 
you can do that beginning now on the front page of our website. You'll see a big button. If you click on that, it should take you about 30 seconds just to let us know how many people are coming in your party and whether you're planning to sit uh, outdoors or remain in your car. And our team is going to be prepared to receive you and direct you that morning uh, in a way that I think you'll, you'll find is uh, very uh, helpful to you. So I know that I speak for so many uh, of us uh, when I say that I absolutely cannot wait for us to have the opportunity to be together again. And why don't we close this service uh, just by praying for our time that is coming up next week. Would you join me? Father, we thank you so much that uh, this morning we were able to listen to your word and sing uh, praises to you and to uh, just spend time reflecting on what you tell us is true in your word. We cannot wait to be able to do that together in person next week. And we pray that just as we will now be able to be together again physically, we pray that on June 7th that you would unite us uh, together in unity and love, uh, not only for you, but for one another. We uh, know that it has been difficult for us to be apart, and so we just celebrate the opportunity to be together again next week. And we pray for all of the different details that need to be accomplished this week in order for that uh, service to happen and for those who are, are volunteering and serving in those capacities we just ask that you would uh, help them and strengthen them and give them wisdom i know that uh, each uh, person who's a part of our church will need to think about how they'll participate and so we pray for wisdom in those decisions as well but we pray that you would use our time uh, this summer to draw us closer to you. We pray that this would be a summer of real joy and faith and love and, and unity that would um, uh, be experienced in our church in all sorts of different ways and forms. And we thank you that you are a God who we desire to worship. Uh, you are a God who by your grace and mercy in Christ draws us to yourself and so we pray that you would give us a, a, a great desire to do that and that you would deepen our heart for you. And we ask uh, all of these things in Jesus name. Amen.